in a series we're starting this week called Counterculture. And really, uh, we're really kind of talking about cancer culture. You know, cancer, cancer culture right now is such a hot topic. It's something that is just running rampant in our culture and our society. And I will be the first to tell you, if you've not already heard it, it's not Christ. Cancel culture is not, is not Christ. It is not the heart of Christ. And we're going to break that down. I'm going to show it to you. Maybe you're in the room. You're like, oh, what? I'm, I'm glad you think that way. We're going to show it to you biblically. But here's what I do know, that cancel culture is not a new thing. It's cancel culture is not something that just started happening in 2019 or 2020 or whenever cancel culture started. Cancel culture has been going on for since really the biblical times. And I'm going to show you a picture of that here in a moment. But here's what I know, you know, where this, this term canceled culture come from, this term canceled comes from when a TV show is canceled, your favorite show, whatever show that may be, you get canceled, it gets canceled, and you're like, oh man, well why is it canceled? Because no longer will it exist, it's, it no longer happens, it no longer is gonna be being made, and so this concept of being canceled has got this the same concept of, we bring it into our lives, and we say, okay, this person wronged me, or this person did something that is against what we think they should do, and so let's just shut them out. Let's just cut them off. Let's just say they don't, they don't, they don't, they, they don't exist. Let's, let's like make them lose their jobs and make them do all this stuff. And so again, this is not Christ-like. And I wanna show it to you today in John chapter eight, starting in verse one. And I'm really excited about this series because I really believe uh, this is a word for our church. And this series, I wasn't planning on doing, but God kind of put this series in my heart. So we kind of rearranged some things because I believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to us through this next few weeks. The Bible says in John chapter eight and verse one, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives. But early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered. He sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of religious laws and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says this, to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him. Check it out. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and he said, all right but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote the dust. I love Jesus. I love you. He's like, you know what? You, you coming at me. You're telling me all this thing. I'm just going to kind of draw on the sand, draw on the dust. Then they said, they keep demanding. He's like, all right, he stands up. He says, fine, fine. If it, we'll, we'll, we'll condemn her. We'll cancel her. First one that, that hasn't sinned, throw the stone. And he doesn't even talk to him. He doesn't look at him. He just goes back to this. I'm gonna go back to drawing him. I love it. I love Jesus. Okay. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Jesus then stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No one, no, she said, uh, and Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. This concept of this picture of these men, these Pharisees and these Sadducees, they find this woman doing something that is against the law of what they are called to do. And so they catch her and they bring her to Jesus in front of a crowd. And so they say, Jesus, what do you say? This is what the, this is what the law says. What do you say? And Jesus doesn't respond. Jesus starts, he starts drawing on the ground. He starts writing on the ground. And so then they keep demanding, Jesus, get up. What do, you t what do you want us to do with her? And Jesus says, fine, I'll answer you. He doesn't answer what they're asking. He says, if you've never sinned, the first one who's never sinned, I want you to throw the stone. You'd be the first one. And then suddenly, as, as he goes back to writing on the ground, these men have this revelation. And it says, from the oldest to the youngest, I believe it's because the oldest are the wisest. Come on, somebody that's a little bit older. We have we, a little more wisdom and then all the way to the youngest one and they all disappear. Jesus looks up, he looks at the woman. He says, where are your accusers? Did no one condemn you? She says, no. He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This concept of this cancel, cancel culture is so unlike Christ. In fact, I would go a step further. I think it's anti-Christ. I think it's an anti-Christ spirit that's trying to get us to a place where we live a life with no grace. 
And I want to talk to you about it today. The topic of my message today is canceling cancel culture. Y'all see what I did there? Canceling cancel culture. And the first thing I think we must do that we see in this scripture is we got to cancel being cruel. Cancel cruelty. John chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives. And but early the next morning, he was laid, he was back at the temple, and a crowd soon gathered, and he sat down right and uh, sat down there and taught them. He was then speaking to the teachers of religious laws, came, and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. How cruel. Like, think about this. This woman made a mistake. A big mistake. She makes a mistake, and in what they first do is say, here's what we're going to do. Not only are we going to catch you in the act of doing whatever it is that you're doing, here's what we want to do. We want to bring you to Jesus. But then what we want to do is we want to bring you in front of a crowd of people to accuse you. Isn't it just like our culture? A few people find something that they disagree with and they bring it to the masses. Post it all over social media. Post it all over the internet. Next thing you know, now we don't even get to determine whether it's right or not wrong. We have to go with what the masses are saying. It's the same thing. They bring her in front of a crowd. They're trying to trap Jesus in this moment because he, they know, okay, he's going to have to really say something. He can't just walk away now because all these people are watching. I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I, we live in a culture where we say all these themes like be kind. If you can be one thing, be kind. And we wear our shirts, love one another, but yet the culture is so cruel. We live in a society that feeds on being cruel to one another. Well, they did something wrong. People should know they did something wrong. Well, uh, no, it doesn't. Just because someone did something wrong does not make it okay for us to justify us being cruel to them. The Bible says that we should love our neighbors and our enemies. The ones that we like and the ones that we don't like. The ones that we agree with politically, uh uh-oh, and the ones we don't agree with politically, uh uh-oh. We live in a society where we're feeding and we're looking for things for people to just say, okay, they did this, let's everybody, everybody shut them down, cancel them, don't go to their jobs, boycott them, do these. And here's what it is, Christ comes, I love it. He's completely counter of what the culture is doing. And the Bible says that Jesus doesn't even respond to them about what they're saying. We live in a society that, that, that just feeds on cruelty. In Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10, how do we know this is not biblical? It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. This concept of us living in a society where we say, we're, okay, yeah, we want to be kind. Yes, and our brains, we want to be kind. But then something happens. And here's what's interesting, okay? Here's what's interesting. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, these religious leaders, they bring them to bring the woman to Jesus. Okay, check this out. The Bible says that Jesus was in the, in the temple and he was teaching the crowds. Okay, he was in the temple, the church, and he was preaching and teaching to the crowds, people who desired to hear from him and probably more than likely follow him. They bring him to these, this, these people. Here's what's interesting. This is what the Lord showed me. See, oftentimes we look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and we say, how could they? But see, they're just, they're part of the cancel culture, but then the crowd is just as much as a part of the cancel culture. Why? Because they're sitting there watching. And there's nobody saying this isn't right. There's no one standing up and saying, you shouldn't be doing this. There's no one saying, show forgiveness. There's no one saying, show love. The people are actually feeding on it. And oh my goodness, if most Christians, what we do is we may not, we not be the ones to say it, but oh, we get on the social networks and we're just scrolling. We're like, we're popping the popcorn. Ooh, look what they said there. (gasps) Can you believe they said that? (gasps) And we can be, what we're doing is we're helping feed the culture with, oh, well, we're not saying it. No, but we're a part of it by being a part that's saying, we're not gonna stand up and saying, let's be people that forgive. 
Let's be people that love. Let's be people that are kind, not just get caught up in watching it. And again, it's such a cruel thing. The culture and the society is so, think about this. Think about this. Oh my goodness, it's so sad that what we do is the cancel culture is this process or this concept of you have to be perfect. And if you're not perfect, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use your worst mistake against you. And I'm gonna use it against you to the point of where it causes the rest of society to look at you and define you by that mistake. I don't know about you, but I've made some mistakes in my life. Could you imagine, just for a moment, go back. I know we're not supposed to do this all the time, but just for a moment, if you would, think about one of the greatest mistakes you've ever made. We all have them. We all know them. We all know. Like, it doesn't take us long to think about the, the big mistakes we made. We all know. Think about one of the greatest mistakes you've made. And now think about for your, your future, for your present, for the people that you know, the relationships, your, your, your boyfriends, your girlfriends, your husbands, your wives. Think about all, they define you based on that one mistake you made. It's cruel. Oh my gosh, is it not cruel? And it's not Christ. There's no grace. I want to be a Christian that is like Christ that always errs on the side of grace. Oh, you, you offended me. I'm going to err on the side of grace. Oh, well, well, you said something that was negative and you shouldn't have said that. Or you did something... I'm going to err on the side of the grace. Why? Because in the end, what I want to be is I want to be someone that's showing Christ to all people whether they offend me or they don't. Is this okay? We need to be a people that cancel being cruel. John chapter 8 and verse 3, it says, He was speaking to the teachers in religious law, and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. It says, They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses said to stone her. What do you say? Then they were, they were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote it in the dust with his finger. I think we should be a culture, a society that cancels cruelty. But then also, we need to be a people that cancel uncovering. Cancel uncovering. It says they find her, and it says they, dr they drag her in front of the crowds. They expose her. They expose her greater sin. And here's what I know. Christ is not into the business of uncovering. Now, you're like, <gasps> Well, you're saying we're supposed to hide our sins? No, that's not what I'm saying. But here's what I do know. I do know that we are not to be a people that expose everybody's sins. We are to be a people that love people and talk with them privately about their faults, not expose it to the crowds. And so it's interesting if you show it, if you read it in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. We should be a people that are in the covering business, not the exposing business. It's interesting because we're like, oh, well, they, they did something wrong. Or, oh, well, they, they, even, even, even communicators and pastors and teachers, oh, well, they're not living the way that they should be living. It's not my job or your job. It's not in the job responsibility page of being a Christian for us to be the sin police. It's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to love Christ and one another to the point of where, now here's what we do. Now, if you cause the fault, yes. Now we go to one another in private. I wanna show it to you. It says it in the scripture, just so you know, just in case you don't believe me. It says it right here. And... Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15, it says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Don't go publicly on social networks and blast it for the whole world to see. Can you believe pastor so-and-so? Or can you believe dot, 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 so-and-so? Can you, ah! That's exposing. Christ is wanting us to be a people that covers not hiding sin, that's not what we're saying. We're saying covering sin. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. It's so interesting to me as we read this text that we see the scripture says that they're, they're, they're walking and they're going and they're bringing this, 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 this woman to Jesus. And the Bible says that they start talking to him and it says they're trying to trap him. And I love what Jesus does. He gets on the ground and he starts writing. Now you can read theologians and all different type of uh, people that study scholars. They say different reasons and different things they think he was reading. But here's what I do know. I love 
I love that Jesus didn't get caught up in all the noise of what the culture was saying. I love, in fact, Jesus almost was minding his own business. You know, oftentimes we as, a, as Christians, as our culture, as a society, we love the, the, feed, the feed of what's going on and what's happening because what we do is it causes us to be able to focus on someone else's business. And if we're focused on someone else's business, it causes us to not be concerned and not have to worry about our own business. And let me tell you something, all of us, we got some business to work on. We all got business to work on. And so it's, it, what happens is we, we get caught up in what they're doing. So now we don't have to deal with our own business. And, I, and here's what I know. I know it. I know it. I know it. Some things, a lot of things in this society or things that happen are none of our business. What someone does at the workplace that you're working with, if you're not their boss, it's none of your business. Oh, well, if I tell the boss, well, then I'll get, I'll get elevated and I'll get a promotion better. Well, here's the deal. How about you just love the person and let God bring the promotion? So many things in society and life are not our business. I know this. I want to be a person that minds my own business. Why? Because I know I got a lot of business to work with and I'm not minding my own business. Here's what's going to happen. Somebody else is going to be worried about my business. Because what I sow... Thank you, thank you, is what I reap. What I sow is what I reap. It's this concept, this culture of, okay, I'm gonna mind my business. Listen, it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. You don't have to get caught up in, uh, for those that are young people in the room and you're, and you're single, who's dating who and who's doing what and who's doing, and it causes us, or who said this, or who did that, or who did you, it not, doesn't matter. In fact, what happens is when we focus on other people's business, it's very easy for us to get caught up in gossip. And here's what gossip is. Gossip is abusing the God-given influence that we've been giving to use for self-gratification. I'll say it again. Gossip is abusing the God-given influence that he's given us to the point of where we are using it for our own self-gratification. Let me explain why. What happens is if you're, if you're talking with someone, if you're in a relationship with someone, let's say a friend, you, that's, God's given you that friendship. God's given you that influence in that, of that friendship. So now if I speak something that's negative or gossip about someone else, what I'm doing is I'm using that influence that God gave me for my own self-gratification. Let me explain why. When I gossip, it makes me feel good about myself. Why? Because someone else appears to be worse than me. So now I can justify the way that I live because of the way someone else is living. And so now I can feel okay about it. And let me explain something. In gossiping about someone else's injustices will never, ever, 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 ever be good enough to forgive us of our sins. Our sins will never get to the place where we can gossip about someone else and now our sins are okay. And so it's important for us to understand this because again, we live in a culture and a lot of people don't talk about gossip, but a gossip runs rampant in our culture because everybody wants to know about what's going on and everybody wants to happen what's happening over here, over here, and you hear about over here. And I wanna encourage you, mind, I want to be someone that minds my own business. No joke, because I'm a pastor, people will like come tell me stuff about other people all the time. And sometimes I'm like, I don't want to hear that. <gasps> well, you're supposed to be like a loving pastor. I am. That's why I don't want to hear about it. Because in the end, it's not my business. If they come to me and talk with me about it, it's part of my business. But me just sharing all these things, why? Because it, it causes me to have, now I'm, I'm, I'm participating in the gossip and now what's happening is now I'm, I'm saying that my sins are not as big as their sins. Does that make sense? So important that we would understand this. They try to trap Jesus. I love this. I love this because they trap Jesus and, and here's what it is. They, tr they, they get him to the point of where, and this is how the culture is. They, they, they say, this is what the law says. And then they say, what do you say? It's exactly what the cancel culture is like. This is what it is. Now I need to know what you think about it. 
And so you need to pick one side or the other. You need to choose. And how you choose is gonna determine how, what, how you are affected by this situation. Here's how I choose. That's none of my business. So I'm not gonna have to say, sometimes it's okay. Oh my goodness, for, for Christians, it's sometimes okay to not say anything. Yes, stand up for what you believe. Yes, I'm not saying that you should just say, you know what, do whatever you want. No, stand for what you believe. But sometimes it's okay to say nothing. Why? Because sometimes by us saying things, all we're doing is fueling it even more. I don't like the way they're doing things or I don't like the way they're saying things or I don't like the way they're running things. Or I, it's all good. Let us put our trust in Jesus because we know in the end, he's the one that makes the decisions, not us. We need to cancel the uncovering. We should be a people that cover it, cover people, not expose people. John chapter eight and verse seven says they kept demanding the answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let uh, the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. They stooped down again and wrote in the, the dust. He scooped down again, and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd. They say the law says we need to stone this woman. What do you say? Jesus writes, in the ground. They demand, what are you saying? What are you saying? What do you say? He says, all right, I'll tell you what I say. Let the one that throws, that casts the first stone, let him be the one without any sin. The Bible says that they begin to slowly walk away one by one by one by one. And you know, we as a culture, as, a, as Christians, a counterculture, we need to be a people that cancel casting stones. We need to cancel casting stones. See, casting so stones is this. It's very quick to judge. We judge people by one instance. We judge people by one mistake. We judge, judge people by what other people are saying about this, these people or this person or whatever. And God wants us to be a people that are not quick to judge, but quick to love. The Bible says in, in, in Matthew chapter seven and verse one, it says, this is, a, this, is a, this, is a, this is a this is a scripture for all of us. Do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will also be judged with the measure that will you use, it will be measured to you. The way that we judge here is the way that he judges here. If I judge because of, some, of someone else's sins, he's gonna judge me because of my sins. If I show grace, he's gonna show me grace. And I'm gonna be 100% honest with you. I want a lot of grace. Maybe just me, but I want a lot of grace. And so here's what I'm going to do. You may make a mistake. Someone may sin. Someone may say something wrong. Someone may do something wrong. But I'm going to, I'm going to err on living on the side of grace. Why? Because by the measure that I judge is how he judges. This is a crazy scripture. Because as Christians, and I'm not saying crazy like bad. Because as Christians, we say, we put on the uniforms and we say we're good Christians. And oh, we don't judge people. But in the back of our heads and our minds, we say, oh, I can't believe that. How could they? <gasps> I'm not, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to love them. I don't have to like them. But here's what it is. But what, by the way that I show it here is the way he shows me here. And so here's what I want. I want to be a people. I want to be an individual that shows so much grace. Oh, well, you're just saying sin's okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying sin's okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm not the judge of sin. And in fact, I don't want to be. I don't want, oh my goodness, I don't want to be that has the responsibility of being God. Here's what I want to do. I want to love God. I want to love people. I want grace from God. I want to show grace to people. It says, as we continue to read in verse three, I think it is, it says, why do you look at the speck of the sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, oh my goodness. First take the, 
First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, we all know this scripture. Everybody knows this scripture. You've heard it. Even if you don't go to church, you've heard this scripture. You know, you got to take the speck out of your own, I mean, the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of someone else's. We all know this scripture. But here's the real question. Are we living this scripture? Are we living in a way where I say, okay, God, what in me? What in me needs to change? What in me is wrong? What in me? God, what in me are you trying to cancel? Not what am I trying to cancel on someone else? The plank in my own eye, because here's what happens. I can get so caught up, and I believe this. We can get so caught up in our own stuff that we don't want to have to deal with our stuff. So now what we're trying to do, we try to go around the plank, and we say, oh, we see something wrong with you. So now let me see something wrong with you. So I don't, I don't have to focus on what's going on with me. And in my heart, and my issues, and my mistakes, and my faults, and my insecurities, and my fears, and my doubts. You want me to keep going? It's my. Let us be a people, hear me, as we're talking about canceling culture. Let us be a people that are quick to love and slow to judge. So let's take the plank out of your own eye. Now, here's the thing about planks in our eyes. Most of the time, as individuals, I would like to call them blind spots. There are blind spots in our eyes that most of the time we don't see or we're unaware of. This is why it's so important to have godly relationships around you. You should, every man in this room, you should have godly men in your life. Godly men, this is why we do small groups. I'm not trying to plug small groups, but go to a small group. You know what I'm saying? And so we, we, we have godly small groups. Why? Because it's very difficult to see blind spots like this. It's when we get in circles with each other and we begin to talk and we begin to share and we begin to encourage one another. We start to be able to see one another. We start to be vulnerable with one another. We start to be able to use, and this is where the exposing, uncovering should be. Not in a, in a, in a, in a, on a, a large platform, a large stage or a social media. It should be as we talk and we walk together individually. Women, every woman in this room, you should have godly women in your life. Why? Because so that you can have conversations. Why? So that you can begin to uncover and you can begin to show people who you really are. And so that people can see your blind spots and so that we can share with one another to help one another. The Bible says iron sharpens. Sharpens. Thank you. Praise God. It sharpens one another. And so this is what it is. We gather together. See, oftentimes we can say, oh, well, I don't know that person, so I can cancel them. That's me sharpening them. No. Sharpening is when we gather together and we're closely, intimately conversating and having conversations and walking together and living together. Now we can talk about each other. Hey, I see that you're treating your wife this way. Maybe you should make some changes or some shifts. I see the way that you're treating somebody like this. Maybe you should. And here's what happens. Now we can see the blind spot. And so now we go home and we say, okay, I need to change the plank my eyes. I want to focus more on what I got going on than what somebody else has going on. And maybe you're in the room and you say, I don't have any planks. There's your plank. (laughs) I would encourage every person in the room. I told the college student this at college night. I would encourage every person in the room. He's trying to make me real spiritual. (laughs) I would encourage every person in the room, for those that are married in the room, not your spouse. But I would encourage every person in the room, if you're dating someone, not your boyfriend or your girlfriend. But I would encourage every person in the room to go to one of your friends that you know they believe in you. You know they're there for you. You know they love you. You know that, they're, that, you know that, they are, that they are there because you are you and no one else. The people that you know, you know, you know everybody's got, we got a couple, you know, there's just those people. I would encourage you to go to them this week. This is your homework. I would encourage you to go to them and say, what's a blind spot? What's something in my life that I got someone going on. What's, what's, if you would, you go so far as to say, what's wrong with me? Now, here's the problem about when we do that. Oftentimes, we do that and we say, hey, uh, friend, whoever you are, friend, share with me a blind spot in my marriage. And then, friend, so-and-so says, you're selfish. And immediately, what I like to do is, I ain't selfish. Shoot, you selfish. 
Go to your friend and say, show me a, show me a blind spot in, in my life or my relationship with God or the way that I, I see life. And they say, well, to be honest, you're kind of lazy. I'm like, lazy? I ain't gonna lie, you're the laziest person I ever met in my entire life. We immediately get defensive when we hear something that's wrong with us. I would encourage you in your life this week, ask someone, not a spouse, not a boyfriend or girlfriend, ask them, hey, what's something in my life that I need to work on? And I would challenge you to not get offended. But to take it as love because you know, okay, that's an area I didn't see. And here's what I want. I want to focus on me. And if I'm not focusing on me, I'm going to end up focusing on someone else. And so when I focus on other people, I start to judge people. I don't want to judge people. I want to give grace to people. When I focus on myself, I say, oh, my gosh, I got so many things to work on. Then when I see someone else is doing something, I'm like, you know what? Give me grace. Why? Because I need a lot of grace. Is this okay? I would encourage you, ask somebody, what's a plank in my life that I'm not seeing? And I'm telling you, everybody in this room, you know, if you got that friend that really is there for you, you know they're about to tell you, you know what I'm saying. They're going to tell you. And I would encourage you not to just take it as someone's opinion, but to saying, okay, I trust that the Holy Spirit is using that person to speak to me, let me walk this out. Let me start to work this out. Because then what happens is, as we're working those things out, God helps us to show grace to those around us. We need to be a people that cancel culture. And then lastly, as we close today in John chapter eight and verse 10, it says, then Jesus stood up again. He said to the one, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. We need to be a people that cancel canceling people. I love this. Jesus, he looks up and he says, where are your accusers? Where are they? Did anyone condemn you? She says, no. And then Jesus says the greatest words. He says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. See, here's what's so cool. This woman made a mistake. In this culture and day and age, a massive mistake. Huge. One of the worst you could make. I mean, terrible mistake. But Jesus never once thought about canceling her. In fact, Jesus did the exact opposite. He wanted to restore her. See, God is a God who is in the restoration business. He is a God who is always wanting to restore. He is always looking for restoration. In every situation, in every circumstance, in everything that we do wrong or right or whatever, he's always looking for restoration. He never said what you did is okay, but he said, I'm not gonna cancel you or condemn you Go and sin no more. See, when we're talking about cancel and cancel culture, oftentimes people are canceling people because of major things that they did in the past. Could be something like racism. Could be something like sexual immorality. Could be so, it, it's all different things. But here's what I know. There are no levels. There are no levels that get us to where we say, well, no, they should be canceled. Or, no, we should condemn them. No. Everybody in this room that knows me knows, every single person in this room knows, I hate racism, I hate it. It's one of, my, it's one of the great, I believe it's the, from the, the, devil, the devil himself. If you're from New Orleans, you say the devil. You know what I'm saying, the devil. You know, D-A, devil. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's, like no kidding, it's one, of the, it's one of the things that drive me. If you know me, you know. It drives me absolutely insane. It doesn't even make sense to me. But I do know this. Because someone said something racist 10 years ago does not make it okay to justify us condemning them. <gasps> you're saying you agree with racism? No. Oh my goodness, no, if you heard that, you heard that wrong. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. We have to be a people that say, no matter what they've done or said to con that we should be able to condemn them, God never condemned, condemned them, so we shouldn't either. Is this okay? Because here's why. Let 
oftentimes we see this story. And we're like, oh, we're, we're like Jesus. We're showing grace. We're showing grace. We're writing in the sand, minding our own business. We're like Jesus. Or often we say, we look at it and say, oh man, am I a Pharisee? Am I a Sadducee? Am I someone that's, am I someone that's, that, that's, that's causing people to, 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 to expose people? And do I need to work? To, or am I one of the crowd? Am I just watching? Am I I'm not standing up enough? And I'm not standing up for people and saying, love them. And, become, am I? and here's what it is. Really, the one that we are the most in this story is not Jesus. It's not the Pharisees. It's not the crowd. The one that we are the most like in this story is the woman. (laughs) Well, I've never committed adultery. No, but you have sinned. And the Bible says that all have fallen short. And the Bible says that none are good enough. And so here's what happens. We oftentimes miss the fact that we all at some point were in the dirt and our mess, and our shame, and our guilt, and our sin, and our garbage at the feet of Jesus. And we needed somebody to say, I forgive you. We needed somebody to say, we still believe in you. All of us in this room, let us never forget, oh my goodness, let us never forget the moment that we were once at the feet of Jesus and we get to the place of where we stay there because we know at his feet is the place where we know we will always receive forgiveness. None of us are better than the other. You could go find the greatest heathen that you think is a heathen on this planet and you and and me and them are all the same. Why? Because none of us are the same. We are all nothing. We are all but dirt without the love of Jesus. And so if Christ is willing to say, I won't condemn you, oh my goodness, how much more should we? Why? Because we've received that forgiveness. We've received that grace. We've received the removal of shame and guilt and condemnation. We've been able to build on our past, not be defined by our past. And so why would we not do the same thing? Let us live. Oh, I'm closing, I promise, after the 20th time. Let us live as a culture that is counter to what the world tells us to live. God is wanting us to be a people that loves, but not just loves, continues to work on us. And as we continue to work on ourselves, we begin to continue to remember, Jesus, without you, we're nothing. Amen. Can we pray today, Father?